The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Who is January Jones? She is not a young, beautiful, talented actress on Mad Men. She is not an older, gorgeous, exotic dancer from the Johnny Carson Show. She is an author, and she wrote, Thou Shall Not Wine, the 11th commandment that reached number one at Amazon.com. She is a reality TV golf personality with World High Stakes Golf televised on HDNet. She is a humorist and winologist expert. She is your featured host today on January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So sit back, relax, and get ready to laugh and listen to Ms. Jones with her eclectic roster of guests as you learn life's lessons. These stories plus sharing equals success. Welcome and remember, beware. Because you are entering the no whining world of January Jones. Hello, I'm January Jones, and I'd like to welcome you to our podcast today. Now, for my listeners, let me ask you a question Do you have your own financial advisor? Tell me, do you know what an anti-financial advisor is? <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to find out today. Would you like to improve your own cash flow right now? I guess we all would, wouldn't we? Have you ever wondered if your 401k is actually working for you? Would you like to learn what the money myths are that cost people their financial freedom? Do you wish you could meet someone who can tell you what you need to do today, right now? If you could answer yes or maybe to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. And I would like to welcome you to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So now it's time to rest, relax, and get some wine and cheese and crackers so you can join me in the no wine zone. Now let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Our guest, the cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor, is a leading authority teaching entrepreneurs and professionals how to get their money working for them today. He is an author, he is a podcast host of Money Ripples Broadcast, and has been a guest on our show before. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show today, Chris Miles. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Virginia, I'm fantastic. So glad to be here, especially after, what's it been? Probably five years, I think, when we used to co-host a show together on this, on this station. Yeah, yeah, it's been that long. You know, it's interesting because... I, uh, when I took a hiatus and I said, well, I'm going to go off the air for six months. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was doing six shows a week. So I was really getting burnt out. I took my six month hiatus and guess what? It lasted three years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was really lazy. I kicked back and I didn't do anything. And now they entice me back. And it's because this is an opportunity to do this with the TV format and have it on YouTube. And it's an opportunity for me to see my guests and connect with them because you've been on my show so many times. And this is actually the first time we're really meeting face to face. It is. Yeah. We used to just do audio only. Now we're moving on up to the east side, right? We're moving on up to video now. <laughs> yeah, and I love doing it. And I'm only doing uh, one show a week, which is very reasonable. 
for someone my age. You know, let me ask you a question. I'm very curious, and I ask all my guests these days, how did the pandemic impact your business? How did it affect your personal life? What did you do during this difficult time? Uh, my business actually grew <laughs> during that time, um, <laughs> primarily because people were looking for answers, right? Because nobody knew what was going on. They didn't have any clue what was going to change in the world and everything. And, and even our own clients, you know, they were wondering what to do. And the great thing is they were able to stay at peace, just stay calm and stay the course. And things worked out fantastic, uh, even better than we expected. Wow. Uh, so professionally, it was great, not just for me, but even for our clients. Um, for personally, uh, if anything, it got us to really question like what it is that we really think is important. So last year, uh, I know you're in the transition of doing your own move. Uh, we actually moved to more of a homestead. Uh, we moved off the mountain that we're living on. We we're living at 6,200 feet elevation previously, moved okay. down to only 4,700 feet. Uh, uh -huh. but we got more land. So now we've got chickens. We've got big garden that's like 100 feet long type garden space. I mean, uh, and I can't credit that to myself. That's all my wife's masterminding right there. But uh, wow. definitely worth saying, hey, we want more land. We want more self-sustenance, self if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Being more self-reliant, uh, especially when we saw toilet paper go on shortage. We saw eggs, you know, starting to go on shortage and all kinds of things going on in the world. Guys yeah. to really say, how do we become more prepared? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I refer to it as the uh, pandemic pause and pause affected, well, the entire country, the entire world. It affected everyone we know and love. And it's wonderful to hear from people like you who actually uh, have a positive pandemic pause story to share with us. It gives our listeners hope. And I think it's a, a, a wonderful way to live positively in the present. Don't you agree? I agree. I agree. Uh, it definitely gets you to really re-evaluate re your priorities, right? Really see what's important to you. Yeah. Uh, I, I know even for my, my father, it's, it's interesting because he's been, you know, he, I never thought he would live as long as he did. He's now 78 years old. And the guy <laughs> had smoked for since <laughs> the Vietnam War. So he smoked for about 50 years. Um, oh. He... He uh, also ate anything he wanted to. And what then <laughs> when the pandemic hit, by the way, by this point, he'd already had 12 stents put in his arteries. The oh cardiologist God. said if he has two more, he will break his record for any of his other patients. Right. Oh so God. he had mass, lots of strokes, heart attacks, diabetes, bursitis, arthritis, you name it, inflammation galore. Oh when God. the pandemic hit and then they started isolating people, especially if, you know, he was in the care home, he would yeah. get COVID. They would have yeah. to isolate him in the hospital for however many months in Oregon. Yeah. And as a result, he had to kick the habit of smoking. They oh controlled God. his diet. They did yeah. everything. And instead of, you know, you usually hear the case of people dying from COVID. And, and of course, that's not a, a funny thing at all. That's a very yeah. serious thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in his case, it actually saved his life. That's the ironic thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my, our story is sim similar to that because uh, I'm 79 and my husband's 82 and we never thought we'd live this long or and feel so good. Yeah. And when we started into the pandemic, we found out that he had a AFib condition and he had a needed a medication that was made by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. And this medication was uh, $20,000 a month per month. And so we went to uh, through Medicare and through the VA. And I wrote a, an interesting uh, email that I sent to uh, one friend of ours who happens to live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who replied, surprising us, and my husband did get the medication, and he gets it every month now. Wow. And so his health has improved. And I think a lot. this is a common story for a lot of people who were compromised, mm -hmm. that this change of lifestyle actually forced us to get healthier than we've ever been before. That's true. Yeah. You know? That's actually since the last time we hosted a show together, um, I actually dropped 30 pounds. 
Good um, for you. Not not just from 2020, but 2020 yeah. didn't didn't hurt either. Um, yeah. But uh, but actually now I'm I'm a marathoner. <laughs> so Wonderful. I actually just finished running the Chicago Marathon. I actually running ran in the top seven percent in the world oh, uh, in that oh, race. So, uh, yeah, um, you know we did a a marathon. We did the Honolulu Marathon in oh, 19, wow. 1978. So that mm -hmm. tells you how long ago that was. And I'm so proud of that T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't quite fit me anymore, but I mm -hmm. said to my kids, I want to be buried in my hot, my marathon t-shirt. <laughs> it's, it's such a awesome uh, accomplishment. I bet you really celebrate it. Didn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. It was definitely a great, great reason for celebration. Oh, well, I'm impressed. Top 7%. I'm really impressed. I think I was in the bottom 7%. <laughs> but, you know, I finished. So I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest accomplishments. That, you know, that was my first marathon. Same story. <laughs> yeah, it's a great feeling. Right yeah. now, we're going to hear about my book, Thou Shalt Not Wine, the 11th Commandment. And uh, we'll take a little break. Lately, there's a whining epidemic in our world. People are even whining about whining. Are you sick and tired of listening to everyone whining all the time? So was January Jones, the author of Thou Shall Not Whine, the 11th commandment that reached number one at Amazon.com. Ms. Jones based her book on a survey of the top 10 things that people whine about at all ages and all stages of life. January is a success coach that can tell you how to help others. When you buy Thou Shalt Not Whine, the 11th commandment, you'll find out what people whine about and how to stop them from whining. This is the perfect gift book to give or get for any occasion. Thou Shall Not Wine was voted the best gift to be given anonymously for those special people in your life. Ms. Jones is an internationally known author in the style of Irma Bombeck, specializing in housewife humor with her book being published in Korea and China. You can find Thou Shall Not Wine at Amazon.com. Welcome back to the No Wine Zone with my former co-host and guest today, Chris Miles, who is not a whiner because he's a winner, <laughs> especially after he shares his marathon. Impressive, impressive story. You know, Chris, before we uh, visit some more, could you share with our listeners your contact info and uh, our engineer will post it on the uh, sign below running by so people can contact you and get your books. Yeah, best place to go, everything you can find is on moneyripples.com. That's R I P P L E S.com, moneyripples.com. I actually have a free ebook on there called Beyond Rice and Beans Seven Secrets to Free Up Cash Today. That's on there. We'll talk about probably some of the things we might even touch on today, but uh, it definitely goes more in depth with that. Okay, wonderful. And uh, Money Rimples is just posted up there right now. Write that down. And after the show, go to it. I highly recommend it. You know, in the introduction, I mentioned that you were an anti financial advisor. <laughs> and I know Money Ripples is your fabulous brand. But tell us a little bit about what anti advisor means. Yeah, it means really questioning everything you've been taught by any financial advisor or most financial experts out there today. Uh, if you really go back, I mean, it's really about spend nothing, save everything, save it forever. And hopefully someday you might have something, right? That's typically what it is. And, uh -huh. you know, my story first started actually with, I mentioned my dad, right? He's lived much longer than he ever expected. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he was the one that taught me about money. He, he was born pre, you know, during World War II. So he had very much that depression mentality of save everything, spend nothing. Um, I was supposed to be the first one to go to college in our family, which I did technically. I didn't mm -hmm. finish, but I did go to college. Me too. And, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, he, he taught us about money. But it wasn't from a place of abundance. It was from a place of lack, of scarcity. Yeah. It was always saying things like, hey, we don't have enough money. We can't afford this. Money doesn't grow in trees. You know, what do you think I am? Made in money? You know, all those <laughs> phrases you would hear. Um, the one that was most impactful to me was, he said, Chris, I'm going to die working. I'm going to work until I'm dead because oh. I won't have enough. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that kind of stuck with me as a child. 
And of course, like any teenager, you know, I always said, Hey, I'm not going to become like my dad, right? I'm going to do it different. Mm -hmm. So during college, I was actually going to become a business consultant. I was about to go get my MBA. And then I thought, well, I should have a real life business experience. So I dropped out of college with one class to go. I took oh, no. a sabbatical. <laughs> it's only going to be a brief, brief sabbatical. But I said, I want to get real life business experience. Let's start a, some kind of business. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I thought I should start a business, gain some experience, and then go back to get my MBA. And then I'd be a more well rounded person when I came out of college. Yeah. Well, I went to do that. And of course, the first business that came up was becoming a financial advisor, the first one that really stuck with me. Uh -huh. um, mainly because I didn't realize it was so easy to get in. I didn't realize you just had to pass a test and have a heartbeat and no criminal record and you can become a financial <laughs> advisor. And that's what happened. And yeah, uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I enjoyed it. It was, it was great. But, uh, but you know, and, and the thing that stuck with me, of course, was the, the things that my dad said, saying, I'm going to work till I die. And the thing I remember seeing when I, thinking that went through my head when I first sat down was, you know, if I can give him one year of his life back, would that be worth it? Not to mention anything I learned to do it differently than what he did because yeah. he was the ultimate saver, penny pitching saver. He paid off his house early. He was so proud of it and mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Well, a few years into being a financial advisor, he said, Chris, I want you to sit down and look at my finances and see if I can retire. Okay. So I did. Sat down with him. He said, Chris, I'm 61 years old. What do you see? What can I do? <sighs> I said, dad, well, if I'm to be brutally honest, let's hope you die in five years. Well, that's saying it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dad's a brutally honest guy. So I had to play his game a little bit. He yeah. said, well, that's not what I hope to hear. No. Especially because he did everything right. He paid off his house. He was saving and packing in the money in his 401k. But he only had about five years worth of his current expenses in his retirement accounts. Because Y2K had just hit him. He was just coming out of Y2K. And, and yeah. that, was even, that was even before the Great Recession hit, right? So oh, all okay. this stuff was happening. And I said, well, you have social security that should help things extend a little bit longer, but it's not going to pay for everything. Well, what do I do, Chris? And I said, I don't know. You're doing everything right. Uh, and yeah. it was at that moment I realized something was wrong because remember I was trying to give him hope. Yeah. I couldn't give him who had actually done everything by the book. I couldn't mm -hmm. give him hope. And I started to look at my own clients. I said, well, how many of them are really financially free? Well, none of them, because even the ones that are retired still worry about running out of money. Yeah. Okay. Well, how about financial advisors? If, if there's any evidence, shouldn't there be a financial advisor that's financially free too? And I don't mean off the commissions they're earning from the streams of income from their business, from the money under management. I mean, mm -hmm. actually from doing these investments, actually putting money in mutual funds and be able to live off of it. Uh -huh. And guess what? There's a, I was in an office over a hundred guys and I knew guys even outside of that office. I couldn't find one. Wow. And, Wow. And then I looked at myself. I said, Chris, you didn't want to become like your dad, but guess what? You're right on track. As you were living cheap, you were trying to pack money away into your mutual funds, hoping that someday you maybe by age 40, you'll be able to retire off of 60,000 a year. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the case because it hadn't worked. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, I started looking at evidence. And I had clients, by the way, that I inherited from other financial advisors with decades of previous help. So these people weren't just starting in the last few years that with me, they had had decades of financial advice, yet nobody was financially free, including the very financial advisors selling this crap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was that point I had, to, I had to make a decision. I said, either I stay in integrity and uh -huh. get out of this thing, or mm -hmm. I just stay in this business and keep selling something that I know probably won't work. Yeah. And so I chose the former. I ended up leaving. I decided I was just going to become a mortgage broker and teach ballroom dancing on the side because another <laughs> known, little known fact, I was one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers about 20 years and 20 pounds ago. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't I know that. <laughs> but here's the crazy thing. I, I still, it drove me nuts that I didn't have an answer. And, <laughs> and I started to find people that actually had done it. And these people were in business. These were real estate investors. People that actually had done it had become financially independent by their 20s and 30s. Wow. So I started to copy what they did. The next thing I know, I became financially independent myself when I was 28, almost 29 years old, mm -hmm. able to retire by doing the opposite, by being that anti, creating that anti-financial advice, doing the opposite of what the standard financial advice was, not yeah. putting my money in 401ks and IRAs, not putting my, you know, paying off my house early necessarily, mm -hmm. not doing any of that stuff, but actually doing the opposite. And that's actually what created more financial freedom for me. And now, uh, since then, uh, 
many, many others. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when did you come up with that brilliant uh, brand, Money Ripples, that I adore? <laughs> it was actually when I was out on a run just almost exactly 10 years ago to this day. Oh, really? um, I was actually out for a jog. I was feeling that I was going to launch a new business because I was already working with another partnership. Mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to grow and go beyond that, but I was scared mm -hmm. to make that leap. Uh -huh. uh, fortunately, um, it was actually October 11th of 2012. So just 10 years ago, uh -huh. um, I'm sitting in their office talking with them about you know our future plans. And the next thing I know, the COO comes in, slides the letter across the desk and says, here's your termination letter with the non-compete. Um, pack your stuff up and get out. And this is the business I helped build. I was, I was just short of getting my partnership, even though I should, I was already acting like a partner. Yeah. They said, you know, we just don't know how this is going to work. Uh, it seems like you're not happy here. And it's definitely showing. And they were right. And mm -hmm. so uh, I ended up, fortunately, just the month before I was on a jog and I was thinking about the vision I had, the, you know, that bigger vision I wanted to achieve that right. I was hoping to do in that company, but wasn't happening. And that bigger vision was the people we'd already helped because we'd already helped people free up I mean, millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, we didn't even talk about investing in real estate or anything like that. Just helping people find and free up money after the last recession. Uh -huh. uh, the average client found 34000 a year. Wow. And I thought about what that did for families. And I thought about how it, it helped not just the couple, but it helped their children. And it taught their children a new abundant way of looking at money and doing it differently. And I uh -huh. thought about that ripple effect where that creates not just in their family, but generations beyond them and also across their community, the country, and ultimately across the world. And as that, that moment, the, the name Money Ripples popped in my head. Yeah. And I immediately did a, a U-turn. I turned back home. I said, I'm running <laughs> faster than ever. You know, this is before my, I was really running marathons. I'm running back home saying, I hope nobody's taking that name. I hope nobody's taking that name. Money Ripples, Money Ripples, Money Ripples. <laughs> Ran all the way back home. It was available. I took it. And uh, of that, course, a month later, they let me go out of that company and Money Ripples was officially born. Okay. Now, I, I know you have, this is an amazing success story, and I'm so glad you've come back to share it again with our fans. Uh, when you did this, you were completely on your own, or did you have another partner, or how did it start up? Yeah, when I launched Money Ripples, it was really on my own. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. me, and uh, that was That's, a kind of lonely place to be, right? I was just going to say, that could be pretty scary, couldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was starting from scratch. I actually... I, even though in Utah, it's a right to work state. So, you know, non-competes don't really mean anything. Still, I kind of gave them that verbal agreement of, yes, I won't play in your sandbox. You can keep all those chiropractors and dentists you were working with. I'll mm -hmm. play on my own. I was working, especially with entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs at the time. Okay. And, uh, and for two years, I was just playing a different sandbox than them. And, and now yeah. I've, I have a much wider, broader audience. But uh, yeah, I mean, I honored that. And, and despite all that, all those obstacles and starting from scratch, uh, we were very blessed. We still at least hit six figures our first year in business. Oh, and yeah. uh, and this, it's been growing ever since. Yeah, this is a fabulous success story. And I'm so glad we can share it again with our listeners. You know, right now we're going to take a little break. And we're going to talk about who killed Kennedy. And it's coming up on 60 years. And people are still wondering who had the motive, the means, and the money to commit the perfect crime. Let me ask you a question. Are you still wondering who killed Kennedy? Over 50 years later, the assassination is still a mystery. It is unfinished business for our country. Now, get ready for a theory that you've never heard before, but will make more sense than any other conspiracy theory that you've ever heard in the past. January Jones speaks the unspeakable in her book, Jackie, Ari, and Jack, The Tragic Love Triangle, connecting Jackie and Aristotle Onassis romantically prior to JFK's assassination. Did you know that Ari was Jackie's guest in the White House during the JFK funeral? He was the only non-family member who was invited by Jackie to stay there during the funeral. Aristotle Onassis was one of the wealthiest men in the world, with the means, the motive, and the money to order an assassination that was the perfect crime of the last century. Ari needed class, and Jackie needed cash. They were perfect for each other. Now, what is Camelot? It is but another tragic love triangle. 
Jackie, Ari, and Jack is available at JanuaryJones.com, Amazon.com, and Audiobooks.com, read by Ms. Jones. Welcome back, and I want to share with our listeners that my book, The Christina, which is about the Onassis fabulous yacht, has just come out in audiobook, and so it's available. It's pretty juicy to listen to when you're driving around town. We're visiting with uh, Chris Miles, the creator of Money Ripples. Now, Chris, um, you've talked about, I think you've started already to talk about the money myths, you know, the things like pay your house off and do all of that. But uh, what are some things that our listeners right now could do to improve their uh, cash flow as we speak? Yeah, you know, one of the best things you do is just starting right off the bat. It's number one in our in our book. The number one thing to start doing is really start tracking your money, uh-huh. not just what you're spending either, um, although that's important, but uh-huh. track money coming in and going out. Okay, See, it's interesting the two scarcity type of uh, type of money mindsets, right? There's two in scarcity, but only one truly in abundance. Mm-hmm. There's the spender and the saver. Both are in scarcity, and they both make up the bulk. Of our of our people today, mm-hmm. um, funny enough, many times you'll hear certain uh, savers on on the radio. People like Dave Ramsey, right? They'll yeah. say, "Oh, everybody's a spender out there today." It's actually the opposite. Most people are actually savers in this country. Really? More people are, yeah, more than half people are actually saving in their four hundred one ks. They're actually saving and putting money away. Yeah, um, the minority are actually spenders. Uh, so if you think you're a savior, you're in the minority and you're, you're like, you got this like nice little bow tie on thinking you're proud of yourself, beating your chest. Guess uh-huh. what? You're part of the majority. Um, okay. And both are still in a place of scarcity. There's yes. never enough money, right? Now, spenders, we get it. Like they, they, it's easy come, easy go. They're always having to hustle and work to create more money that they uh-huh. spend and they never have enough, right? Yeah. And savers also never have enough. This is where financial advisors teach you from. They uh, just like all the financial experts teach you to be a saver right? They teach you to put away the money, lock it away from yourself, put in those 401ks, put it into your house equity that you can't get to, like what happened in the last recession. People couldn't get equity out of their houses and they foreclosed. Even if they had equity, they lost it because of what was going on. Mm -hmm. All that's been taught to us. Yet even savers, they can never pay off debt fast enough. They can never save up enough money to ever truly feel financially free. Okay. The best way to do that is to become a steward of your money to be a wise steward. Uh-huh. And the stewards look at both sides of the equation. See, savers only look at what they spend, but they ignore about what they make. Yeah. Spenders only look at what they make, but they ignore what they spend. Okay. Stewards do both. Look at both, track them. Great tool to use would be mint.com is a great one to use to be able to automate that, make it easier to track your money and really know where your money's going, both money coming in and going out. And that's, that's the thing. If you want to get from point A to point Z, or point Z for our neighbors internationally, right? You want to get to those points. You got to make sure you know where point A is. Most people I've found don't really know. They might look at their bank account balances, but they don't really know how much is being spent. They don't know truly how much they're making and ultimately how much cash flow they have left over, how much extra cash is left over at the end of the month. Sometimes it's reversed. Sometimes there's too much month at the end of the money and they're stressed. So you've Mm -hmm. got to know that first. Yeah. And that uh, website, I'm writing this down, I hope my listeners are too, would be mint.com. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Okay. That's a very good tip. What else should we do? Yeah, Another thing you should do is, is looking at getting rid of, really decluttering, right? Get rid of stuff. Um, sell oh. off your crap, so to speak, <laughs> right? Empty out that garage so you can park your car again, whatever it might be. Uh, sometimes people are like, well, I don't know where to find cash. Well, do you have a lot of junk? Um, I, I knew one woman in particular, she had a lot of kids, um, was they were very much paycheck to paycheck, never had enough, but they had a lot of stuff, a lot stuff. of just everywhere. You yeah, are, I, you are speaking to my husband who is <laughs> music to his ears because before we went on the, with the broadcast, I had shared with Chris that we're in the process of moving and mm-hmm. we're. We are really getting rid of a lot of stuff. And it's it's almost really therapeutic, isn't it? Especially when you move a couple of times back to back, it really gets you to prioritize what what do I really want here? Because every time you move it, 
it's a pain, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. And each try it's so much fun bringing it down, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as far as saving money, I think, you know, my goal was always, I always used to joke that I want to run out of money the day before I die. And so I would say I'm probably a pretty good spender. And fortunately, my husband's a pretty good saver. So it kind of works out for us. Uh, okay. Cool. And I yeah. certainly am decluttering. So after I get rid of all this stuff, then what happens? Yeah. And by the way, when you get rid of stuff, my, my mantra is if you're not going to use it, lose it. You know, either sell it, donate it. So at least you get the tax write off if you donate yeah. it to charity, right? Oh, by the way, extra tip here. If there are books or DVDs or CDs, you know, media like that, you uh -huh. can actually donate, donate those to a library and get double the tax write off versus okay. just sending it to like a goodwill. Oh, okay. So that's kind of an interesting yeah. thing that I actually learned from my wife. Um, uh, kind of a cool, cool deal that sad my accountant didn't teach that to me though. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, if you're not well, going to use it, lose it. I've got a whole file of tax deductions. I, every time we go to Goodwill, I note everything down. And I even mm -hmm. took pictures of a few things because I thought if they were ever questioned. Okay, donation and library double. That's interesting. That's a yeah. fun thing to know. No, who would know that? Your yeah. wife. She'd be the CPA. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, so that's. I would say that's the second tip. Third one, you know, we mentioned this talking about like debt, right? Because, uh, you know, debt, you know, I'm not saying that everybody should go into massive debt because the truth is, if you're one of those two in scarcity, a spender or a saver, debt uh -huh. is actually not a good thing. Okay. Obviously, if you're a spender, you're going to blow debt and it's just going to be a, a, a horrible hole that you're going to create for yourself. Yeah. As a saver, it creates so much stress because you're scared to owe people money. Yeah. The ironic thing is, though, for savers is that for them, it's not about the balance. For them, it's about, I owe somebody money that I'm obligated to pay money to. Uh -huh. What happens, though, is they mix that up with expenses, right? They start saying, well, I mean, really, even if I'm debt-free, and this is what I've seen happen, people that are like the Dave Ramsey poster children, in fact, they almost always become our clients yeah. uh, because they, they saved up everything they could. Their financial advisors think they're heroes, but it's never enough, right? And they're, they don't even pay off everything except maybe their house. Sometimes they don't always pay off their house, but they're close. Yeah. And then they look at everything. They say, well, I'm asset rich and cash poor. Well, for a saver, the expense is the thing that they hate. They hate the payment. But even if you go debt free and yeah, maybe you free up 30% of what it might've been 25 or 30% of your expenses, you still have the other 75% that weren't debt related that you're still having to pay out of pocket. Yeah. So it becomes this, this really imprisonment, this prison mm -hmm. that you've created for yourself because of that, that scarcity, emotional reaction to, spending or expenses of money yeah. um you can only you can only be so cheap to the point where you're living out of cardboard box and i don't recommend that <laughs> no. so when it comes to debt um you don't fear it fear is a, a symptom of scarcity yeah. instead you respect it it can be either a tool to help you or it can actually destroy you uh -huh. you as a steward determine what that is okay so now when i do look at debt there are some debts i want to pay off Often we may want to pay off credit cards, right? Oh, yeah. Now I use a formula called the cash flow index. What that is, is that you take the balance of whatever loan, it could be a credit card, it could be a car loan, it could be a mortgage, whatever it is, mm -hmm. take the balance of that loan, divide it by the minimum monthly payment. Okay. And you'll get this index number, a cash flow index. The lower the number, the more you want to pay it off. In fact, you want to pay off the lowest number first. Okay. So let me give you an example. Uh, yeah. Say that you have two ten thousand dollar loans. One's a credit <laughs> card. One's a car loan. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the credit cards will say it's eighteen percent. The car loan's four percent. Right now, yeah. if you were Dave Ramsey, he would say pay off which one. If all you had was ten thousand bucks. Yeah, the credit card. The credit card, right? And most savers would. Yeah. Now let's just say that credit card at ten thousand dollars is a two hundred dollar month payment, which is pretty yeah. typical for a credit card. Mm hmm. The car loan, however, is a $500 a month payment. Okay. Now, even though it's lower interest, that's a bigger payment from a common sense standpoint, especially if something goes wrong, right? Because life can ha happen fast, come at you fast. Mm -hmm. Which one do we pay off first? Common sense would say, let's get rid of the $500 a month payment. Yeah. Why? Because you can always pay the extra $500 to the credit card and pay it off fast anyways, right? Yeah. 
but many people are told, no, pay off that $200 a month credit card. Well, if things could happen where either your income drops or expenses go up, you would much rather be paying $200 a month, that credit card versus 500 a month to that car, which you might end up losing and having to have repossessed, which yeah. you don't want. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you take the math, you know, 10,000 divided by 200 bucks is 50. That's the credit card. Yeah. 10,000 divided by 500 is 20, which is the car loan. The yeah. lower number, the 20 is the one you want to pay off. That's the one you go for first. Okay, that's a that's a good tip, I, and it's a, a just a, you know actually it's just a different way of looking at things, isn't it? And I yeah. think uh, I think this is the the beauty of what you're doing, and I want everyone who's listening to be sure to write down moneyripples.com because I think this is probably uh, a good tip for me <laughs> right now. I'm going to share some unforgettable, priceless personalities. These are all people who have been on my show through the years. And I have two books that are available at Amazon.com. Have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Someone who has touched your heart and soul? People who have faced difficult problems? People who have struggled to find solutions? People who fearlessly shared their stories? People who have not only informed you, but inspired you. People who have priceless personalities. I have been fortunate to host an internet radio talk show called January Jones Sharing Success Stories. And it has been my privilege to interview hundreds of guests. My guests have shared their stories, their struggles, their secrets, and their successes in their own words. In this book, we're talking about people dealing with problems such as incest, molestation, runaway kids, child abuse, drug abuse, polygamy, unemployment, scandal, and starting over. Then there are my guests dealing with difficult physical struggles such as blindness, cancer, and birth defects that are beyond traumatic. My guests have all been exciting, eclectic, and energizing. They have amazed, amused, and even astonished me. I have adored getting to meet them, and I adore sharing them with you. Attention all listeners, Priceless Personalities, Success Stories Shared by January Jones, Volume 2 is now available at Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. You'll be able to meet 10 amazing people who will be sharing their own personal stories with all their struggles, successes, and solutions sprinkled with lots of humor and hope. Priceless Personalities features a teenager who becomes one of the famous Supremes from Motown, a nurse who has a humorist helps people to heal, an inspiring laughter yoga instructor, a mother dealing with the loss of a child, an incredible motivational speaker, a woman who married five times, a gifted paranormal nurse, a wise economist, a funny female humorist, along with an older man sharing his sweet childhood in the deep south. January's guests are all amazing and amusing. You will never forget meeting them. Go to Amazon.com for your own priceless experience. Welcome back with Chris of Money Ripples. Now, um, okay, we talked about improving our cash flow. Uh, how is it possible for your money uh, to pay you twice? This is an interesting concept I think we should explore. Yeah, so many times people, when they put money into savings or checking, it goes in there, it sits, and then you spend it, and it's gone, right? Right. But there's a, and that's, and that's great. I mean, it serves its purpose and there's a purpose for that. But uh, how would it be if you could put your money into a savings account that doesn't get taxed, it's tax-free, uh -huh. and then you can also get money away from it at the same time. So the money still stays there, but you get access to that same money and almost like make a copy of it and get that to start investing for you and making you money too at the same time. So it has that double dip effect. That's oh. the kind of thing we're talking about when you create an, what's called infinite banking. Okay. And, and there's many people have talked about like becoming your own banker. Like there's a Nelson Nash, who's kind of like the, the grandfather of the, that concept. Uh -huh. But, uh, but I've learned over the years, um, I was first taught that concept actually when about the same time I became financially independent, a lot of the real estate investors were using this strategy, but it was more of a long-term strategy. They're trying to use the put away. They weren't double dipping on it where money was paying them twice. 
Mm-hmm. They were just saying, hey, put this money away. It's going to be there for later, yada, yada, right? Okay. But I learned that I can actually, um, and what the vehicle you use to do this is actually whole life insurance. So whole life has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, it was typically the savings vehicle of choice until really about the mid 80s when 401ks came to be and the government was trying to really promote those. That was like the big thing they're marketing to everybody, right? No. Mm-hmm. Um, but whole life was really the savings vehicle that people were using. Heck, even even Disney World. I mean, that's just in your kind of backyard to the east a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, Disney World was actually started because Walt Disney had a whole life policy that he was able to use as collateral to get a loan from the banks, right? Okay. They were able to use the savings that was in there and got a collateralized loan, but they wouldn't mm-hmm. give them to him otherwise. If, it, if he didn't have that collateral there, Disney World would not, it would have ceased to exist or never existed for that matter after Disneyland. Okay. So you use whole life insurance, but you don't get the traditional whole life. That's the big mistake. That's the stuff that Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman all say it's, it's crap and don't ever get it. And I 100% agree with them. What do you get? You get what I call is more like a max ROI type policy or low cost, higher, high cash value life insurance. So it's still whole life, but there are ways to manipulate. And this is something I found out over the years. that You can actually bring the cost down to a certain amount. You can't get them down to zero, unfortunately, right? There's supposed to be insurance costs there to protect it because the insurance is actually what makes it tax free. It's just like a Roth IRA, but there's not the 59 and a half rule that goes with it um, or all the other rules that the government throws in. It goes in with after-tax dollars, grows tax-free, comes out tax-free. Okay. So if you can lower the insurance costs as low as you can go possibly while still keeping it tax-free, and then the rest of the cash goes in, it builds up that cash account faster. Okay. Uh, in many cases, even in, most of the time, if you buy a whole life policy, in those first two years, you put all that money in, you have mm-hmm. nothing. That's what happened with my first whole life policy. First two years, nothing. The third year, I started get, actually getting a little bit of money in there. And then the recession hit. Things got tight. I couldn't afford to pay the premiums. I lost $25,000 that I paid into that plan because wow. I couldn't keep up those minimum payments, which were the, you know, didn't, didn't give me flexibility. Uh-huh. This is different because you lower the cost so much, you actually get a range of flexibility where you may not even have to, you could pay nothing into it and it could still keep growing potentially. Now, is so, this is this something that our older listeners should consider, or is this just for younger people? This would be best if you're about the age of 70 or less. If you're older, it's a little bit tougher. Uh-huh. Um, you can still get it, but you may not get it with this purpose where you're trying to build up the extra savings because it's going to be more expensive. Okay. Um, you may be looking at this more as like an estate planning type of thing. Okay. But if you're about the age of 70 or less, and especially if you're in decent health at least, yeah, um, this plan can actually do great. So like I said, the first two years I had nothing in it. Now the plans that we set up those first two years, usually people have at least 80 to 85% of the money they put in. Yeah. So much, much different. Um, the reason why you won't find people doing this, like insurance agents doing this is for a few reasons. One, either they don't know how to do it because insurance companies don't teach you how to manipulate the system mm-hmm. or two, even if they know how to do it, which is very few percentage actually know how to do this. The majority of those insurance agents won't do it because it cuts their commissions by at least 75 to 80%. Oh, wow. Wow. So as a result, in fact, I had an argument with an insurance agent when I found out after I lost my policy, the one that sold me my first policy, when Uh I found out I could have actually made it flexible, which I asked him up front if I could. And he said, no, Uh I actually argued with him about it, had a two hour debate. And he finally, when I, when I knocked down all of his little objections and excuses Uh after two hours, he finally admitted, he said, Chris, I can't afford to cut my commissions that way. That's why I didn't do it. Okay. So and I said, that's why you're not going to get any, any referrals from me for other clients. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, that's amazing to have to find that out the hard way like you yeah. did. Now, what about, uh, you talk about be- work, people becoming work optional. Now, mm-hmm. is it something for older people? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, the way to become work optional is when you know you have enough passive income coming in to cover your expenses, right? Okay. That's also known as financially independent. Some mm-hmm. people say financially free. I think financial freedom is a little bit higher number than that. But mm-hmm. ultimately, when you know all your bills are being paid for by mm-hmm. streams of income coming in that you don't have to work for, now you're work optional. Yeah. And that's true whether you're 20 or 200 years old. It's the same, yeah. right? It's how do we get you to be there? And it's actually by doing the opposite of what we've been taught. Remember my dad's situation. He could not 
retire really not comfortably to feel safe. And really, uh, here's the sad part. I mean, you know, we talked about the positive thing that he's still alive. He is still alive and we're grateful for that, but he's not living mm -hmm. because he's well, one health reasons. Like he's now bound to a wheelchair, but uh -huh. two, I mean, financially, he's really just trying to stretch out that money as long as he possibly can with all his VA benefits and social security and everything else, just trying yeah. to stretch it out and all the other savings he had just to try to not run out of money. Yeah. Uh, and that's tough. That's a tough yeah. place to be in. Mm -hmm. And so we try to encourage you to create passive income with that. So give me an example. Um, I had one client, he's out in California. He was one, yeah. he was the fourth highest ranking general um, out for the National Guard out there. Yeah. And I actually had him on my podcast. His name is Dan. Well, Dan was able to retire with a pretty nice uh, retirement plan of about a million dollars that he's mm -hmm. saved up over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, traditional financial advice would tell you $1 million paying only 3% a year because you're not supposed to pull out more than 3% or you will run out of money. The 4% rule they used to tell you, the Monte Carlo simulation, has actually been misproven. 3% is the max you should be pulling out of your money. So in his case, you have a million dollars saved up. You should only be pulling out 30000 a year. Yeah. Think about that. You're a millionaire, but you're a broke millionaire pulling out below poverty level 30000 a year. And then you get taxed on that money coming out of the 401k. Sure. Mm -hmm. So- we did differently. We actually had his money. We went and bought some real estate properties, not in California. We bought higher returning ones, more in the Midwest, the Southeast. Um, uh -huh. Things are at least 10% cash flow returns that you're getting from it. Um, we did some things with like our oil and gas like mineral rights types of investments where you're buying the land and then the oil companies lease from you. Um, again, he didn't do create all these. These are all passive investments where other companies, other vetted investors that we found that they put their money with went and did these things. And so at the end of the day, by the time he was done, he is now generating $11,000 a month oh, passive that's... income from that same million dollars. Wow. That's much better. You know, uh, it's coming to the end of our podcast and I, I've been uh, taking notes, which I always do when Chris is on the show. And I hope you've been taking notes and I hope that you'll go to his website. And if you have any questions and also Chris, let's have a little plug for your podcast. Yeah, definitely by anybody go follow the money ripples podcast. Um, if you use YouTube, we have a money ripples channel. We even do little YouTube short videos and things like that as well. Um, uh -huh. shorter videos that are the content that teach you about different aspects of finances and whatnot. So, um, we do the podcast twice a week, but we put out videos pretty much five times a week at least. Yeah, well, that's where this show goes out too at YouTube TV. Uh, one question before we go, and I ask all my guests, if you could have dinner with anyone living or beyond uh, besides me, who would you like to have dinner with? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm not going to say Jesus, not because that wouldn't be my first answer, but I know a lot of people would say that, so I don't want to sound too cliche. Uh, that would be my real answer because I would love to to be able to have supper with him and get to know him better and how he acts and responds like real behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. if it weren't him, uh, I would say the person living or dead, I would love to sit down with, I would probably say, I, and I'm kind of a history buff. I, I love George Washington. Oh yeah. I, I mean, the guy was a very religious, you know, faithful praying man, uh -huh. but he is just an incredible leader at a time when the country really could have easily fallen apart and how he was able to bring people together. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine. I, I, I would probably crumble under that kind of pressure. I know I probably would, well, um, most but just to, to be able to get to know a guy like that would be incredible. That would be, and I'm a history buff too, history major. So I think we ought to plan maybe in our fantasy world, you invite George Washington and I'll bring Abraham Lincoln. Mm, another good one. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for visiting with us. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed our time together. We've tried to be informational and inspiring. My upcoming guests will all be eclectic, exciting, and energizing, just like Chris. Next Tuesday, the Story Genie will be coming back on our show in costume, since it's going to be our pre-Halloween show. And I'm going to go in costume, too. My 70-year-old thought for the day. When you are dropping something, when you're younger, you just pick it up no problem. 
when you are older and then you drop something, you stare at it a bit and contemplate it and actually think if you'll ever need it anymore. <laughs> and this is what I should be doing, Chris, when I'm cleaning out our garage. <laughs> Now, thank you for everyone for entering the no wine zone with us. And please share our stories and show with everyone you know. Remember, stop whining and then start smiling. And if that doesn't work, you can just start eating chocolate, lots and lots of chocolate. Thank you again, Chris Miles, Money Ripples, to my guests and my listeners. Take care and stay safe until we meet again. We want to thank you for listening to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. Always remember Ms. Jones' personal mantra, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what all of our guests have done with their lives, and so can you. You are the ultimate success coach in your own life. All you need to do will be to start sharing your own story with your family and friends. We hope that our guest stories will encourage you to explore an equation in your future that will combine your creativity, plus connecting with others will enable you to be successful too. Always remember, your passion plus your purpose will equal prosperity as you explore the wonderful world of January Jones.